And I just try my best to remind everyone that's there that even if they're not exactly like me, even if they don't like to move like me, the practice was in a way designed to just get them to move like themselves, to be like themselves, to to awaken their their own inner voice. Hello, yogis, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Dharma Talk. I'm your host, Henry Winslow, and this is episode number 61, which I am recording from Ibiza. I'm here for a hand balancing training, which has been a lot of fun and a nice change of pace. But you never know with the traveling whether you're going to have Wi-Fi access, so I sort of took a risk there. Fortunately, it worked out. Before we get into the episode, first, I want to make a big shout out to my friend Jared Seibert for making a donation to Dharma Talk. I interviewed Jared on episode number 14 back at the beginning of the show, so please go have a listen to hear his amazing story and all about what he's doing for men with his company Yoga Warrior Wear. If anyone else would like to make a donation, you can always do that and it's always much appreciated. There's a donation button at dharmatalk.show or henrywins.com slash dharmatalk. If you've been listening to Dharma Talk for a while now, then you'll definitely be familiar with the name of my guest this week. This show, I interview David Kyle, one of the leaders in the rocket yoga movement and one of the first students and carriers of the torch of Larry Schultz. I had the pleasure of going to spend a week in Austin, Texas with David, taking one of his 50-hour trainings, and that's where we got the chance to meet I also spent a lot of time on my hands down there, but that's actually a topic of this conversation. A lot of people have an idea about rocket yoga being just a ton of handstands. That's actually not the case. There's a deep history and attitude and ethos underneath all of the decisions of rocket yoga and how it verged away from traditional classic Ashtanga yoga. So in this episode, You're going to hear from David about Larry Schultz, the Grateful Dead, and the story of the birth and blast off of the rocket. We talk about a fourth prong above and beyond Ashtanga's Tristana, the breath, gaze, and body that has become signature of the rocket. And then we get into the difference between a Parsva Kundinyasana and a baby freeze and how practicing familiar movements within a yoga context, for David, yielded unfamiliar results. Lastly, we talk about leveraging creative rebelliousness to create accessible freedom for all students to practice, whether they like to handstand or not. All of that is coming right up. Please just stay tuned through these announcements, and we'll dive into my interview with David Kyle, Baba Rocket. Hey yogis, I've got a few workshops coming up and I'd love to see you at any or all of them. On June 1st, I'll be leading a backbending workshop at Yoga to the People in Brooklyn. On June 22nd and 23rd, I will be giving a weekend of workshops at Yoga to the People St. Mark's in Manhattan. First one on arm balancing, second one a purification practice with mantra, pranayama, and kriya. In July and August, I'll be helping out with the 300-hour teacher training at Lighthouse Yoga School. For that one, be sure to enter code HENRYWINS on your application to save $100 on the tuition. And then October 25th through October 27th, Veronica and I will be leading a weekend of workshops in Bucerias, Mexico. Please join us for any or all of these events, the details are at henrywins.com slash events. What's your purpose? What's your vision? What mark will you leave on this planet long after you're gone? I'm Henry Winslow, and you're listening to Dharma Talk, the only podcast where I interview inspirational yogis on how they're changing the world in their own unique ways. Whether you're still searching for your purpose or already walking the path, I hope these stories get you excited to live your Dharma. Hello, Dharma Talk community, and welcome back to another episode. Today, my guest is David Kyle. 
Good. David is the owner of Ashtanga Yoga Puerto Rico and founder of Progressive Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, which honors the traditional practice of Sri K. Patabi Joyce and embraces the revolutionary philosophy of Larry Schultz. Progressive Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga was established in 2004 to promote an Ashtanga-based practice that holds no dogmas or bias towards the asana practice. David's teachings bring a sense of ease into the subtle teachings of yoga and the experience of finding perfection no matter where we are. David, it's my pleasure to have you on the podcast today. How's it going, man? Excellent, Henry. Uh, super stoked to be here. And uh, hello to the community and everybody who's listening gets to hear this. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this interview since before we actually met in person, but I'm glad that it ended up being postponed until now because now I have a sense of your uh, your character and all of your stories having taken your 50-hour training of rocket yoga back in Austin. So I'm very excited to kind of relive some of those memories and share the stories that I got a taste of with the listenership. But first, we always start with the same first question. So I want to lay that up for you. What does the word Dharma mean to you? And what is your Dharma as you understand it today? Well, uh, as I understand it, uh, Dharma is your, your path, um, so to speak. Um, I'm not eloquently versed in it, and so I, I'm not sure how much Dharma may be uh, related to the idea of uh, faith, so to speak, or uh, causality. But um, I, I definitely, in my current position, feel as though the Dharma is something that you can choose. Uh, and for me, my path right now, uh, almost in a sense like a whirlwind, it's something that I, I dove into, but like a very deep ocean, I, I've still been swimming for quite a while now, is uh, this yoga path, the uh, yoga philosophy, and the curiosity that it, it grabbed me in when it comes to the yoga exercises, the asanas, and, and the flow, the vinyasa, the breath. And so my dharma, in a sense, is to share my experience uh, of the practice that I love, which is this ashtanga yoga practice. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't help but catch that you said it's some a path that we can choose. So there is an element of free will in there. I but you also said that the yoga grabbed you. So yes. how do you um, how do you reconcile that? Like where do you where do you fall on this conversation of Dharma choosing you or your path choosing you versus you mixing or intermingling or interacting with it? Wow, definitely. You know, I'm I'm speaking from I guess 20 years of uh, experience in, in practicing the yoga, asanas, and studying the yoga philosophies. But also very quickly after taking up the practice, I, I also did dive uh, headfirst into the, the business of yoga, if you were to give it uh, a smaller roundabout definition of that. So maybe within the first four or five years of my practice, I opened my first studio and have been teaching daily classes there uh, for many years. It was just me and my wife, Elizabeth, who ran that studio. So we teach several classes a day, all through the week, um, no substitutes or anything. And, and then we did get into the idea of teacher trainings, which uh, was encouraged to me by, by my teacher, uh, Larry Schultz. And the idea of the teacher trainings back then was to train a, a small group of people that could help you with your studio that could be teachers at the studio so you as an owner you wouldn't have to teach everything so in that context of uh, the yoga kind of taking taking over me so to speak I, I would definitely say that you know once you become a teacher and it's a full-time thing even when you may wake up in the morning and feel tired and you don't want to go in there, there's not a boss for for you to call uh mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and in the beginning there's not another teacher for you to call the substitute so to speak so it does take over uh you and your life and what you do it consumes you sometimes we make jokes about it you know warning our students not to let yoga consume their lives uh literally but uh it does in many ways 
<laughs> yeah, at a certain point, it's inevitable if you go deep enough down the rabbit hole. And I and I think opening a yoga studio definitely crosses that threshold. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. This is this is an interesting idea that you you brought up about um, teacher trainings initially being just an, an internal necessity. You know, to to absolutely. train your own staff. How has your experience? Um, shifted with that now that you're leading these trainings obviously they're not geared directly toward your studio in puerto rico when you go and teach you know a 50-hour intensive in austin or shanghai or wherever the, wherever the place may be absolutely no um definitely in the past uh four or five years i've i've taken to the road so to speak <clears throat> and and by demand mostly uh I, I tend to be a little bit more of a speakeasy uh I don't always put myself out there as well as I could, or at least I've been told. But by demand, you know, people are, are very interested in this particular form and style. So, you know, when I first started, the first 10, 15 years, yeah, the trainings were all internalized. Uh, we hired many of the people who came out of the trainings if they were local. And it started to shift a little bit as the growth of yoga itself um, has grown. But I know this is, uh, in a way, a hot topic right now, because I've even had some internal discussions with, uh, with my school, which still continues to run teacher training programs, even as I travel and run some of these programs in other schools in other cities and countries. And often now, I have an amazing group of teachers uh, that have been teaching in my studio for five, six years study. Um, it's their home for the teachers as much as for the students. And so there is no more room for growth, yet we continue to run teacher trainings. Um, many of these is because students do contact us. Uh, people do want to find an entry, so to speak, into, into the yoga experience and the yoga field and teacher trainings. Practice intensives, these are always the way that students kind of immerse themselves into the practice. But it is, in a sense, flooding the market. Now, I think this could be taught differently when it comes to even what we did together in, in say, Austin, uh, which the name teacher training is associated with uh, our, our rocket vinyasa intensives because we encourage that space to be for teachers. Um, you'll notice the majority, uh, almost 100% of the participants are already some type of 200-hour teacher um, from alternative styles, possibly some from Ashtanga. Uh, and they're using these as inspirational weeks to inspire them into a new practice, inspire them into some new creative spaces. And what we're noticing even as we do this is many people are ready to uh, jump on the train or we could say jump on the rocket ship, uh, meaning they, they do want to go home and take these particular sequences uh, which do produce a certain experience in the student and, and bring it back to their studios bring it back to their communities. And as this particular growth takes place inside our community, uh, myself as well as a handful of others, I, I believe we're just uh, abiding to the demand. Um, you know, if we, if we took the higher road, so to speak, um, which maybe encouraged more people to refrain from jumping into teacher trainings, into these intensive experiences, to uh, take that information to do the same as we do, which is share the love of the practice with their communities. Um, then we also would hold back the growth that's taking place. You know, I, I feel as though as much as myself individually could be part of the exposure and helping put this particular practice out and put these teacher trainings out, so to speak. Uh, it's also by popular demand um, where we're driven by the consumer. 
this is right. what they seek. Yeah, and and I think you struck a really good balance with the integrity of of what you're promising with these these trainings. I remember you said um, at the end of ours, you're like, you know, we offer these 50 hour trainings quite often, and doing one 50 hour training, one five day stretch doesn't necessarily mean that you're ready to go out there and, and teach rocket yoga. This is your chance to get inspired and see if it sits with you well, see if it's something that you want to pursue more deeply. Absolutely. But clearly there's, there's quite a lot of demand for this. Why don't you take a moment and um, explain, you know, what is the rocket for those that are unfamiliar? What makes it different? What is characteristic about this style of practice? Well, wow. What is the rocket? So, I mean, first, like, like many practices, I, I, I say paying homage and, and acknowledging uh, the lineage, so to speak, is one of the things that we like to do in the yoga practice. Um, and that's where many of these stories and things, they come from. And at the same time, it gives the student who is maybe new to a practice the opportunity to, to get a slightly different feeling uh, about what the practice is about which could lean maybe more towards the philosophical aspects. And so, you know, rocket vinyasa is, is the, the, the birth or the brainchild of uh, Larry Schultz, who is an Ashtanga yoga teacher that came out of San Francisco. Um, he started his practice in late seventies, eighties. And after many years of practice and tutelage with uh, Patabi Joyce, he, he took his experience and he went back to San Francisco. And he opened up one of the, I think there were three yoga studios in San Francisco when Larry Schultz decided to open his, which um, I, I'm not sure how it is now, but San Francisco at a certain point, yoga studios were like Starbucks. Um, they were one on all, every corner. Yes. One on every corner, sometimes same styles, but often multiple styles. So any type of style or uh, form, um, I mean, we, we know that all yoga is the same and leads to the same source, but at the same time, we, we do have this idea of styles that exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's like different routes, different paths in which uh, the practice takes you. And so Larry was on the, the forefront, on, on the, the first wave of individuals who felt as though this could be not only uh, a life practice, for many of us, it does become a lifestyle, which you have to be careful about that. Once it becomes a lifestyle, you're slipping into that hole a little deeper, right? Versus just a practice. But he also had faith that it could be something that created a sense of uh, support, uh, social support um, in, in the context of monetary value. So it could uh, help you live, help you eat, help you support others. And as Larry started to provide the Ashtanga yoga practice to the general public, he came to many realizations uh, about the average Western body, which is a little different from Eastern bodies. And for many years, I, I, I heard this and I just took it by context. But now after going to uh, China and working in China for the past five or six years and leading many trainings, uh, there is a difference in how our bodies move, you know? And it has a lot to do with your lifestyle, sitting in chairs that are lower to the floor, um, being willing to squat and things like this, have their hips and knees much, much, much more open. And from what I've heard, same in India. Now you come to the West and you have this slightly different body build and a different lifestyle, people sitting in chairs, uh, the majority of their life from lower education all the way up. And whenever Larry was introduced to the students who started coming in, one of the first things he noticed was they had a lot of difficulty um, accessing many of the postures that were inside the Ashtanga sequencing. In, in order to cater to the student, he started creating some changes, modifications, even chose to omit certain postures of the seated series. Um, and he produced a class that he called the Modified Primary, which is a class that focuses more on the flow 
action that's produced inside the Ashtanga Vinyasa practice and less focus and attention on the idea of acquiring a posture or completing a posture. So at this time, it was, it was revolutionary because many of the teachers who, who taught back then, and there were only a few Ashtanga yoga teachers, um, you had to teach by the book. You had to teach the way that Patavi taught you. Um, and so for him to choose to step outside of the box, so to speak, uh, it kind of outcasted him a little bit. But Larry was a, a great soul. He was very, uh, very much in tune with being on the good side of things. And so he embraced that particular aspect. And he developed a philosophy in a sense that his true teachers were his students. And his goal and objective was to provide a class that worked for them, right? Um, which in turn, if you think about it, even Krishnamacharya used to provide the same context. You know, he always said, that he would teach yoga that was good for you, not good for everybody, good for the individual. And in a sense, Larry wanted to do the same thing. Now, the wild turn where the rocket starts to uh, come into play is after Larry had been teaching Ashtanga yoga for a little bit, he, he was introduced to the Grateful Dead, who um, was a very iconic and revolutionary band at the time. Uh, I'm sure many listeners and viewers uh, know exactly who that is and if you don't know who it is it's okay you, you can go ahead and find out because it's necessary unacceptable yes <laughs> you, you, you have to learn about this piece of uh, subculture so to speak that existed back then and uh, for Larry it was a dream come true uh, he was definitely a, a believer and a follower uh, he, he was part of the family and being given the opportunity to, to go on tour with the Grateful Dead. And he developed a good relationship with Bob Weir uh, in particular and started to provide them with the teachings of Ashtanga Yoga, this practice that he loved. And as he went on tour with them and maintained his philosophy that his students are his teachers, he, he kind of flipped that a little bit, that idea of Shakti Pata. Um, Shakti Pata typically traditionally is the idea that the teacher or the guru uh, creates a, a descent of power, it sends the power and energy into the student, empowers the student. But we believe it can easily be flipped and seen as the opposite, where the student is actually empowering the teachers. And it's our, it's our job and goal, sorry if you heard that. It's our job and goal to, to direct the student in the path that's best for them so they can uh, realize their true nature, their, their inner voice, listen to their inner teachers. When Larry started teaching with the Grateful Dead, uh, he had to take this full force because the Grateful Dead was definitely not going to hear, we need to practice at the same time, same place, you know, you come to me concept. Um, first of all, you're on tour with the Grateful Dead. So you as the teacher, you go with them. Where they go, you go. And when they're ready, when they have time, when they have energy, they will practice and you have to be ready to teach them, right? So you have to always be ready to teach. And as he worked with the Grateful Dead, which, you know, you're dealing with superstars, so to speak, rock stars, you know, uh, just as bad as Brody's. Uh, these guys, they, they do a lot of torment to their body. And so they're not going to be the most agile, the most flexible, the most acrobatic uh, individuals. And so same, same, delivering the Ashtanga yoga practice to them was something that had to be softened and catered. And eventually they pushed Larry, they encouraged Larry to create change, change within the repetitive nature of the Ashtanga yoga sequencing. They encouraged him to make change in the hierarchy. And so some of the things we like to say about rocket vinyasa is that it destroys the hierarchy of asanas that exist within the Ashtanga vinyasa practice. And it allows students who may be considered beginners or novice, new to the practice, to experiment, to play and, and work with um, more advanced postures from the second, third, fourth series. Now, as Larry started to rearrange 
the postures of the Ashtanga Vinyasa practice, he, he developed a, a flow format and sequence. Uh, when you do the rocket vinyasa practice, you're, you're practicing the fundamentals of Ashtanga vinyasa. Uh, the tristana is present, breath, bandha, awareness of the body, the asana, the dristi, focusing of the gaze. And you link this through movements that are used from the classical Ashtanga yoga, fundamental asanas. So you have all your postures that are there. But one aspect that Larry encouraged in his philosophy, which I believe was a fundamental aspect of his development of this practice, Raghav Vinyasa, was creativity. Creativity from the individual practitioner, uh, creative rights for the practitioner, for the teacher to explore the same philosophy as him and allow the student to become the teacher, allow yourself to open up and be um, perceptive enough to awaken the student's inner voice that sparks uh, the creativity, that brings the inspiration that they really need, that yoga has the ability to flourish. It's like a flower, it just needs to be fed. In that sense, you know, we, we do practice classical Ashtanga yoga. We love our formula that's inside the classical practice, but it does not necessarily provide creativity. It doesn't support the idea and context of creativity. And the only way you can do that is to, to have a more free form. I, Very I, cool. Yeah. I, I think I, that's a, it's a good summary and a good, I like the story behind it too. There are a few pieces of it that I'd like to go back to and kind of revisit. Absolutely. Um, something that was that seems to be very core to the crux of Rocket is this idea of destroying the the hierarchy. You mentioned it kind of in terms of the teacher student relationship, uh, where it's not necessarily Shaktipat straight from the guru to the student, but sometimes more of an exchange. I'm sure that was the case with the Grateful Dead and Larry. You know, these guys are sharing it, really transformative higher consciousness kind of messages too. Yes, absolutely. But, but also in the poses, this is a cool idea. Um, what would you say? Um, well, actually, let me take that back. I'd like to go a little bit into, into your story now with the, with your introduction into the rocket vinyasa, I know that you brought in a level of creativity that um, comes from your background as a dancer. So how, how did that all unfold? And how would you say that your unique background with the B-boy the B dancing has influenced your creativity, this fourth piece of the Tristana, the, you might even call it, a, I don't know, a, trist, a Chatur Stana, yeah. Um, into the teaching. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, yeah, I guess I can, let's go back. Let's go way back, way back. Um, I, I think one of my first memories, like m many kids, I'm sure, there's always one that stays a little bit more prudent, but I remember standing on my head and rolling around and having my mother tell me, you know, stop doing that, you're going to break your neck. Um, I remember with my brother, you know, I was born in, in 1980, so somewhere around 85, 86, 87, this was the height of, of breakdancing and b-boy becoming popular. And I've never seen a video at that moment or anything like that. Actually, I never saw breaking or anything. But my older brother, who was a couple of years older, they had a good idea that going down to the street corner, putting down a cardboard box, getting their little brother to stand on their head, and they would spin my legs so I do a couple of head spins <laughs> and then we pick up a few dollars from the neighbors, you know, as we jammed our boom box or whatnot. Um, throughout the years, as I, I grew older, I loved movement. Uh, I was always in sports. When I was younger, I did some gymnastics, uh, really younger, like seven, eight, nine. Uh, did some martial arts as well for about five or six years, uh, Juko Dai Jiu Jitsu, but still all very young, like adolescent, uh, getting into 12, 13. And then when I moved to what I thought was a big city, 
definitely a bigger school um, and shifted a little bit. I, I started playing more of your general sports, like your baseballs, soccers, basketballs. I even played football. Um, I was just a sports junkie. So they had set up the sports to where it would rotate. I played sports all year. Um, but everybody started getting bigger than me, so I stopped playing football. Everybody started getting taller than me, so I stopped playing basketball. <laughs> um, baseball, I lost interest. Soccer, I played all the way up through college. And so shifting to one sport, that meant almost like nine months out of the year or more, uh, I, I didn't have a sport to play. Um, I only had one practice to go to. So, you know, you start getting into different things. I got into music, I got into uh, dancing with my friends, and it was all closet-based. I, I always referred to myself as a closet b-boy. So I, I practiced in my bedroom. Um, I never had crews or competitions to go to. I didn't grow up in New York or California or any of these places where there was an actual scene. I, I grew up in Southern Louisiana in the swamps. And so all I had was Yo MTV raps. And, that wasn't your best mm -hmm. b-boy tutorial. And so it became much more about no body YouTube. exploration. No YouTube lessons. No YouTube, no Facebook, no nothing. No. It was body exploration to its rawest. You know, like you, I was just flipping around and rolling around and uh, doing things. Uh, a lot of the things were exercises, core exercises, different types of push-ups, uh, uh, you know, all these type of things. You know, idolizing people like Bruce Lee and knowing that he did nothing but train all day, train all day, train all day. So I, I got into that concept and I, I wanted to be a b-boy. When I got to college, I got introduced to actual dancers. Uh, I took some dance classes in college as well because I needed a few extra credits. Um, so I've always enjoyed movement, um, but I, I would not wear tights. That was against my rules. They wanted me under tights. But I was a b-boy and I preferred the streets, the street acrobatics. Uh, I enrolled in a few acrobatics classes because I wanted to learn more acrobatic movements for breakdancing. Joined a couple of crews throughout the years. And, you know, I'll fast forward to right about the age 19, almost 20. Um, I was living in South Beach in Miami. And that's when I got introduced to It's Yoga. Uh, which was owned by Reed Taylor at the moment. And he was one of uh, Larry Schultz's students from San Francisco, uh, which It's Yoga San Francisco was Larry's kind of uh, home-based mothership of the rocket, the original home. And I sent my girlfriend, who she's my wife at the moment, uh, so yoga's kept us together. I, I sent her to do a class here because she had given interest, so to speak, towards learning yoga. And my deal was breakdancing. I was just breakdancing every other day, had practices that I would go to and all of that. And after she went and took this rocket vinyasa class, she came back and she said, you have to come do this yoga. You're going to love it. And she started showing me some of the uh, classical postures from Ashtanga third, four series, like Parjva Kundanyasanas, Kundanyasanas, Ashtabhakrasanas, uh, this little move they call Murabanda checkups, which I recognized as a straddle press from gymnastics. And I was like, all those movements were very familiar to me. You know, we call them baby freezes and air flares and uh, all these types of movements were given different names. And so it did interest me. And I... I, I like your names. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> baby freeze. Baby freeze. And so we, uh, it caught me. And I, my first interpretation was, I don't want to do yoga. I... I, I spin on my head. Why do I want to go to a room to learn how to stand on my head? Right. And she said, no, come in. So for me, it was like a practice. It's like you're just in there learning to do things that I already know how to do. Uh, oh, the ego can be strong in a 19-year-old, you know. Mm. <laughs> so, so she brought me in and I had my first yoga class, which was this Ashtanga Vinyasa-based rocket practice uh, I was surrounded by incredibly strong, flexible, experienced uh, practitioners. Uh, they were older than me, so my first interpretation was like, oh, I got this, look at these guys, you know, like, haha, <laughs> this is gonna be lame or whatnot. And within, within a few sun salutations, I was like, what the fuck is going on? What, <laughs> yeah. 
what is this? Wait, what? Inhale, exhale, you know? And I, I figured it out quickly. I figured the breath out quickly. Um, there were little things like the bandhas that, that made sense to me. Um, I had already, uh, I skipped over one aspect. I went through about a year of massage therapy training. So I was, I was trained in, in the body and the anatomy and all these actions. So this knowledge was there and, and I really understood a lot of what the teacher was asking me to do. And sometimes in hindsight, I always wonder if that was a good thing or a bad thing. You know, is it a good thing when a dancer comes in and they have the flexibility, they have the endurance, they're intelligent inside the body, but they've never actually done a practice like this that stimulates the nervous system in such a particular way that when you have the ability to do everything, you may not have the tolerance to, to take that intense energy stimulation, uh, which was definitely my experience. Um, I, w I was able to do the practice. Uh, I was more about walking on my hands than standing on my hands at that moment, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed the challenge. From the first class I ever took, I, I, I was in, in, in love with the practice. It was a passion. I didn't want to stop, but it also created such an intense stimulation inside my body, inside my mind. Um, the experience that I had inside Shavasana is something that I had only experienced a few times before. Um, once before I had experienced it uh, when I was in massage therapy school and I was going through a really intense shiatsu session. Uh, which was working what they uh, refer to as the energy lines inside uh, the shiatsu practice, which is the meridians, similar to the nadis and uh, marmor points inside yoga. And so uh, it was this deep internal experience through the massage at shiatsu, but the yoga practice in the shavasana was more of a deep externalized experience, uh, much more in parallel with a uh, hallucinatory state, um, uh, that I had experienced before, but never naturally, in the way that this practice had. And so for me, immediately, this, this practice, rocket vinyasa, uh, I got up out of Shavasana and I wanted to know what was wrong with me. You know, what had I taken? Um, <laughs> why was I experiencing such an intense, uh, holistic experience, as in all my senses were, were heightened? Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I was encouraged to lay back down in Shavasana, let myself calm down, so to speak, which I did. And that experience uh, for me was a, a glimpse of what the yogis speak about when they talk about uh, Hatha Yoga Samadhi, a lower level of Samadhi in which um, you do have a momentary break from, from the attachment uh, of the body but the mind is still present. It was definitely a trippy experience. Um, I, did, I, I did not fall into a state of meditation. Um, I, I was in a state of heightened stimulation. And slowly with time, I, I've started to learn control techniques like bandhas, and such that have been laid out for practitioners of yoga to control and, and contain this particular feeling of energy and stimulation of the nervous system. And that, that has been also a big part of my, my drive, even coming back around to the idea of dharma. You know, when I say that my dharma is to share the experience of the practice that I love, that, that is the experience that I feel anyone and everyone should, should have when they practice. Um, and maybe it can be found through your yoga practice, which I think that's ideally what it's being designed for you to do, to, to find this control and to awaken the inner body, mind. Um, but you can also find this experience from other external stimulus, you know. Um, but that experience is, is key. It's key to life. It's key to, to being happy in a sense. And is that the reason why you tell people in your 
programs not to call you their teacher. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a thing. And it's a hard one, you know, even when teaching classes, we, we use the word teacher just to communicate. But then all of a sudden, there's this alternative side where <clears throat> we don't necessarily like to be referred to as the teacher. Um, the This is a philosophy that goes back to Larry, actually. And ultimately, what what we mean by this is that the teacher is yoga. Yoga is the teacher. The experience is the teacher. Um, we are more like a guide. If, if you were going to take a hike and go up the mountain and you don't know the route, it would be smart of you to hire a guide. They, they show you the path. Um, they could even show you alternative paths. You know, if you like the guide, you may hire them several times. Um, but eventually you learn the route and, and you take that path on your own. We, we don't look at the guides as a teacher, even though they taught you the path. They taught you which rocks to step on, uh, which parts of the path may be dangerous to be cautious. So they do teach, but we just consider them a guide. And we know that when we get to the top of the mountain, for that experience, for that aha moment, for whatever it is that you seek, it, it's something that you bring with you already. Uh, the guide does not provide you with the scenic um, experience. You know, you walk yourself up the path. And so we, we believe this is important in the yoga world, which, you know, every time we put someone too high up on a pedestal, they usually fall hard anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I think students should continuously be reminded that their inner teacher, their their consciousness is what they, they want to focus on and not put the, the idea of faith in, into the teacher. Yeah, I mean, this is a tough one because I, I do think that having a teacher is it, or a guide, however you want to look at it, is important because the path is, treacherous is elusive and uh, treacherous yes, yes. <laughs> i agree but ultimately it is a personal internal practice and to lay too much um authority or even reliance or dependence upon a teacher ultimately holds you back yes. that's my opinion i mean not to you know sometimes when we get into these spaces it's often clear you know not to dive into the guru conspiracy or to thrash the idea of the guru wholeheartedly. Um, I, I tend to not fall into the idea of extremes, but the teacher in a sense is a tool. It's a tool, um, an amazing tool, a conscious tool, mm -hmm. a tool, a tool with consciousness. I mean, Hey, you know, that's an amazing thing, but ultimately you have to understand that you're doing the work. Right. And, exactly. And the teacher is provided, and, and that's where maybe we have to pay homage to the great teachers um, that sacrifice themselves, that allow themselves to be used as a tool, as a route to understanding, uh, as a um, conduit that creates more clarity towards what ultimately we want to understand ourselves. And... Um, and that's why we talk about lineage a lot as well. You know, we, we don't like to be referred to as your teacher. Um, this is also probably even a good way for us to try and fend off the potential of inflation of ego. Um, if you accept the idea and then you take that responsibility uh, into someone else's practice, maybe it would be even important for us to reflect back and, and remember that the, the great teachers of the past would take one, two students their entire life. That's it. So this is very different from our great teachers of modern time who, who've had hundreds, thousands. Um, and then if and you... Even more different from the, the Starbucks yoga studio industry complex. Yes, even more different from that. And then you could go to the traditional side. I mean, you have the Hindu gurus with millions of followers. And everything I'm saying right now completely contradicts that context. But I also feel as though yoga, it, it, it's 
it stands alone as a philosophy, as a darshan, uh, uh, one of the original darshans from the East. Uh, and it, it does not need to have the religious context. Not all yoga needs to be bhakti formatted, which is devotional. Does it mean bhakti is wrong? No. Uh, does it mean I'm right? No. Um, it's just these are different paths, different routes. Bhakti tends to glorify the devotion of the guru. Um, and not just the guru that stands in front of you, but the one above as well. And I believe in our system, we put more emphasis on the guru that's inside of you. The one that's always there, the one you see when you look in the mirror. Uh -huh. um, I feel I feel like a good way to wrap up the the main meat of this interview would be to address a preconceived notion about rocket, which is floating around out there, which is that it's a lot of handstanding and arm balancing and crazy movements. Yes. And while I, I will say that that stuff is definitely involved and it's a lot of fun, I know that there's a lot more to it than that. Um, could you speak a little bit about um, the importance in your mind of the philosophy? And if you feel it's appropriate, give us a little taste of what Nali land means to you. Ah, yes. Well, um, you know, we, as we had kind of said before, you know, when I, when I started with this practice, there, there really wasn't any YouTube, there wasn't any Facebook, there wasn't uh, the same type of social media and marketing um, that we've taken ourselves to uh, today. And I, I find that a lot of the misconceptions that exist, whether it's rock and vinyasa or any yoga, comes from these snippets. Uh, this um, concept that people only have 5, 15 seconds of attention span, and so that's what we feed them with. Or even more dramatic, the Instagram, it's, these are photos, which, which are beautiful. I'm not against Instagram photos. I'm not going to bash them at all. I even think Krishnamacharya was your original yoga selfie master, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> um, but you know, it's the context that it's placed in. Uh, that does have to be observed um, and, and something that we have to be conscious of. You know, if the context is education or even just celebration of the pose itself, then this is beautiful. If, if the context is to sell something, uh, it, it, if it's to, you know, make things high definition and, you know, airbrushed, then, then I think it's off. You know, it, it needs to stay raw. It needs to stay raw to, to stay more beneficial to the yoga and this when you get into the idea of hashtag rocket yoga i'm not even sure i'm sure they have that out there um, i'm sure they do I, I, I might have done it myself you know <laughs> uh, but um if you go through this i'm sure you're going to see all of what we would call like the funner postures your um again your side crows and crows and somebody really going for you know the quest for the press you know people love to do the press and and inside our practice, there's an open format for this. I think this is what should be understood. It's not required. It's not even necessarily the practice of rocket yoga. It has nothing to do with handstands. Um, it's like looking at a piece of the fruit, like an apple, and describing it only by its skin and not by the actual meat of the fruit. Um, rocket vinyasa has a lot more meat. And the... Handstands are, are just part of what we allow. And in, even in modern day yoga, there's a lot of restriction. There's a lot of context that if you do something that the teacher doesn't say, you're doing something wrong. You're doing something disrespectful. Um, now I know if I were to go practice with, uh, with Sharat, uh, I would do my best to adhere to the rules that they have set in a sense of reverence and a sense of respect. But there needs to be a place where people understand that if they want to spread their feet a little wider or a little more narrow, if they'd rather put their hand on their shin versus grab their toe, if they don't feel like binding today, it's okay. And this venue with the rocket vinyasa leaves that door open. Now, <laughs> it's like playing with fire. As soon as you open that door, a lot of people turn around and realize 
if I want to do a handstand in a yoga class and not just once for like two minutes in an hour, but have multiple opportunities to have encouragement, to have a teacher actually not only encourage me, but adjust me and help me uh, learn these particular movements, um, it becomes very attractive to them. And so as rocket vinyasa teachers, one of the things we always train inside these uh, intensives and workshops and trainings that we give is that we have to kind of calm the rajistic nature of the student a little bit. Um, we're, we're offering the student fire, which that idea of rajas is fire, it's high energy. And we have to teach them how to contain that energy as well. So it doesn't get um, out of control. That's what's most important. You know, it's about control. Now, that being said, if students want to come to the class and not do a handstand, instead substitute it with a downward dog or a child's pose, this is fine. This is something that we always encourage beginners. Um, not everybody starts uh, with a particular level of access. And our system is designed to, to be more of a, a Montessori a beginner's modified version of Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, um, a more accessible. So there should be no fear in that sense. Um, but this, this, I believe, this idea, this context of rocket vinyasa only being um, an acrobatic or a more acrobatic form, uh, which it does have its acrobatic side, I will not deny that. Um, but I believe this will fade when you do have more teachers guiding this particular practice. Because it's not only, again, the students that we encourage to, to be individualized, it's also the teachers, who foremost teacher is always a student. So during the teacher's practice, they're, they're constantly reflecting on what's good for them, what's good for their body, what rhythm stimulates them, how does it make them feel? And this is what they bring to their students, that experience that they have inside their own practice. So ultimately, I've trained individuals who are well into their 60s and 70s. They have no interest in, in inverting practice, but they, they love the freedom format that sits inside Rocket Vinyasa. The more teachers that start to share their passion and their experience, I think the more people will start to understand that Rocket Vinyasa has this particular depth that, in my opinion, allows it to be one of the foremost contemporary yoga forms that we have today. And, and even after the passing of our teacher, you know, Larry, Larry Short's passed and 2011, 2012, and his practice still exists. It hasn't been incredibly long time. Right now we're at about 35, going on 40 years of this particular practice being present in people's minds and people's bodies and people's daily practice. But I feel as though the way Larry set it up, it's given it the ability to maintain uh, a, a living tradition, in a sense. It allows each individual practitioner to, to hold some sense of ownership. Sorry if that beeps up, cyber world, it's not big for me. And so they, they each individually get to take ownership of the practice. And in that sense, you make the practice what's best for you. You know, and that I think some of these philosophical contexts of the practice are, are what's most important. It's, it's the biggest gift that Rocket Vinyasa and Larry Schultz gives to the world. Um, I, I, I am part to blame. You know, I, I kind of talked about how I jumped straight into it, um, into the yoga practice after breakdancing, but I never gave up breakdancing. Uh, I probably, I started teaching yoga in San Francisco and I was still doing breakdancing on the street corner by Gap in the trolley off Market Street with my friends. Um, and for years, I used to say, I'm not a yogi, I'm a b-boy. 
And I do yoga in order to keep my body healthy and strong and my mind clear so I can do more breakdancing. Even for me, breakdancing had its spiritual context. You know, mm -hmm. it was a practice. It was devotional. And Larry gave me freedom. And that was a big piece as to why someone like me stayed in the room. Why this 19-year-old uh, breakdancing hippie street kid, so to speak, um, walked into the room and decided to hang out with this old man, this old yoga man. You know, so I was like, all right, let's give the yoga man a try. And the yoga man says, do. Okay, I do. But then the yoga man says, do what you want. Well, I had a lot of ideas about what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. um, so there are a lot of things that you see today. Um, I've been teaching now for 20 years. So I've had 20 years of influence myself on the practice. Um, that's about 35 years old. You know, it was around much longer, uh, much, much more before me. But I've had uh, a large hand in influencing um, that particular practice through traveling and through teaching and teaching from my heart, from my space, from, from what really drove me to fall in love and have the passion for the practice. And I just try my best to remind everyone that's there that even if they're not exactly like me, even if they don't like to move like me, um, it's fine. That the practice was in a way designed to just get them to move like themselves, to be like themselves, to, to awaken their, their own inner voice. And I think good people, good students are attracted to this. Um, you're not just attracted to the poses. I mean, I, I, I have know people who've been doing yoga much, much longer than me, 20 years. If it's only about the pose, you're going to get bored. There has to be something else. There has to be a deeper drive. There has to be a deeper uh, search within oneself. And, and you use the yoga practice as a tool to help you do that. Totally. So, so for me, you know, I'm, I'm part to blame. You know, they can say, you know, can the real Baba Rocket please stand up? You know, <laughs> um, I, I am known for personally doing as many as 20 handstands in a practice. Um, and I, I preferred handstands over doing the vinyasa itself, the push up, up dog, down dog. I felt like it was too much on my shoulders to do push up, up dog, down dog thousands of times a week. So handstands for me made more sense. Um, but people should not necessarily see Rocket Vinyasa as myself either. Everything yeah, that's, that's, that's you that doing I, you. Yeah, that's me doing me. Exactly. You said it. <laughs> and I, I appreciate you making that that um, that subtlety around what the practice really represents. I personally love it. I love that it has this rebellious creativity to it. And yet at the same time, that creativity, that freedom allows for a more welcoming, accommodating experience for anyone, whatever they want to get out of it for the student and the teacher. And, you know, that is expressive and that is liberating. So thank you. So. Excellent. Thank you, Henry. Why don't we move on to the final section of this interview now? This is going to be the prana round. I'm going to ask you six rapid fire questions and ask you to <laughs> answer in minimum one, uh, minimum one word, maximum one sentence. Okay. Okay. All right. This, uh, this is psychological here. Whoa. I didn't yeah. exercise my brain. Let's go. In one word. Why do you practice yoga? Love. What's your favorite yoga pose and why? Handstand. Uh, I think I explained that earlier. <laughs> yeah, why am I not surprised? All right, what is the single best cue or piece of advice that you've ever received from a teacher? How does it feel? Ah, the question. The question yeah. advice. Oh, Recommend one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Recommend one book, either modern or ancient, for our audience. Uh, I love Swami Vivekananda's book on uh, Raja Yoga lectures um, from the book was from 1894 or something like that. Yes. You can find it. Swami I believe Vikram. that's been recommended before. That's a good one. Excellent one. He's hard is, nailed. It's not an asana book. Yes, yeah, <laughs> not. It's not. And many of the good books are not about asanas or maybe they touch on it for a brief moment. Yes. 
Is yoga for everyone? Yes. Last question. How can our audience get in touch with you, David? And how can we support you in your dharma? Well, uh, all right. Contact. Um, you can always search for me at Baba Rocket uh, on Instagram. I try and stay somewhat active there. But again, I am speakeasy. So don't expect a lot of uh, movement there. Uh, you can always look for my studio, which is Ashtanga Yoga Puerto Rico. Um, I've been here for about 15 years. Please come. We'd love to have you on the island. Uh, we have daily classes right by the beach, Mysore, teacher trainings. Um, you can also check out rocketvinyasayoga.com if you want to see things specifically about rocket vinyasa trainings and stuff like that. Uh, for my dharma, just, you know, I, I, I'm going to quote something that was told to me recently and it really resonated with me. Um, talk to people about yoga. You know, don't be afraid to talk to people about yoga. Let them know that you do it. Let them know that you love it. And let them know that this practice is more than just getting on a map. Um, it's about asking those finer details, uh, those deeper questions in life. Um, challenge uh, yourself and, and your family and friends to, to question why, why we're here. Who, who am I? That's the big question. Yes. Um, I love talking about yoga. Thank you for indulging me in this conversation about yoga and rocket and your story and, and break dancing and everything that you got going on. It was great catching up with you, David. Let's definitely reconvene in Puerto Rico. Come right visit. Jai. All right. <laughs> I, I, will, I will be around, my friend. We'll talk again. And I'll come see you at the New York. This is, this is beautiful. I appreciate you doing this. Hey, Dharma Talk community. If you enjoyed this podcast and you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button right now. And if you'd like to show your support even more, leave me an honest review on iTunes or whatever podcast directory you listen on. You can also make a financial contribution to keep the show up and running, a donation at henrywins.com. And remember, I'm here to serve you. So if you have any questions or comments or ideas, you can always reach me on Instagram at Henry Wins. Otherwise, I'll speak to you next week. Keep living your dharma.